The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. President Franklin D. Roosevelt said this in his inauguration speech. He goes on to say, our nameless, unreasoned, unjustified terror only paralyzes our needed effort to convert retreat into advance. At the time, people were scared from the Great Depression and World War II. They rushed the banks to pull their money out. Their fear only hurt the U.S. economy more. Fear is, a, fear is a powerful emotion that has been used throughout human history. And today, I'm going to be talking about it. Hi, my name is Connor Shaw, and I am talking about our relationship with fear. I want to start off this talk by saying fear affects everyone differently. So when you're talking to someone about hardship or pain or suffering, remember that they are experiencing something different than you. And never underestimate what someone is going through. And there's a few points in my talk which I was originally skeptical about putting in. But I think it's important to know and come to terms with our emotions and how we react with them. And because of this, I want to bring up this idea of fear versus happiness. I believe they're in this constant battle, this constant relationship with each other. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot have fear without happiness and happiness without fear. I think the yin yang does a great job of representing this. And I want you to remember this symbol throughout the rest of my presentation because I'm going to constantly refer back to it and this relationship between fear and happiness. So I want to start off with a little anecdote, which my mom told me ever since I was young, and it's part of the reason that I became who I am today. So at the time, my mom was working for the Olympic Committee, and she was visiting New York. Um, she was on her way to the World Trade Center, and um, she saw the first plane hit. Um, she remembers every second of this day. She remembers every second of every minute of every hour. And um, she even remembers telling the taxi cab driver that morning that the sky was bright, blue, and beautiful though it turned into something she would never forget. When describing the incident more, she goes on to say that the tower falling, the smoke, and ash coating like in your fireplace, it's one of the hardest things she's ever had to describe. But the important thing about this memory is that it was seared into her mind for the rest of her life, but happy moments can be seared into our memory the rest of our lives as well. Obviously, my birth, special occasions, graduations, these memories are seared into our mind just as much as fearful ones are. It all goes back to this relationship between fear and happiness. That day, fear consumed my mom, New York City, and our country. But it wasn't powerful enough to defeat the happiness. So I wanted to dive more into this relationship between fear and happiness. I wanted to get a better idea on how they work together. And I read The Giver to understand this more. Now, The Giver is this fictional society in which the people's um, in the society, their memories are withheld, so they don't experience death or pain or poverty. Now, on the back of the book, it describes the society as a utopia. It's a utopian novel, but I think it's more of a dystopia. Because these people don't get to experience pain or suffering or hardship, they don't get to experience all the good things that life has to offer as well. They don't get to experience happiness or joy or a true love. Now, without giving too much of the book away, because I suggest that you should all read it, one person from each society is tasked with receiving all the memories of human history so it doesn't repeat itself. This person is nicknamed to the readers as the giver. So the giver receives these memories, mem memories of war, of poverty, of suffering, and he realizes that the memories of happiness and joy come along with this. And in our own way, as high schoolers and as we grow up, I think we're all our own giver. We all have to go through the experiences of feeling pain and suffering. And because of that, we get to know our balance with fear and happiness. Now, this is one end of the spectrum. I wanted to get some more idea of the other end of the spectrum. And I um, did some research into suicide. Now, suicide is the act of intentionally causing death to yourself. Um, this can be through mental health disorders such as depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, alcohol, or substance abuse. And um, the important thing here is that it's when someone is lost, someone is in a dark void that they can't escape. And if you're ever in a situation when you feel like this, you need to reach out, you need to get help. And I don't want anybody to ever underestimate what someone else is going through. But I want to bring back this relationship between fear and happiness. I think that suicide is when the happiness completely consumes the, the fear completely consumes the happiness. Go back to the yin-yang symbol, that half red, half blue dot. It's now a full red dot. 
Now, no one in our society has yet to quite get a grasp of what suicide causes and how it works. But I think one person does a great justice at this, and that's Mahatma Gandhi. Now, I've grown up, I've heard different quotes from Gandhi. I've heard snippets, I've seen snippets from his speeches. Um, but I didn't really know that much about him. And I was really excited when I read his autobiography, which he appropriately titled, My, Ex My Experiments with Truth. So for fun, when Gandhi was young, him and his friends, they would take dirt and leaves and they would wrap them up and they would smoke it like cigarettes because they saw it in the Western world and they wanted to be cool. But one day, him and his friends were so bored, they ran out of games to play and they had nothing else to do. So they thought about committing suicide. They heard about this leaf that if they rolled up and put in their little fake cigarette and smoked it, that they would eventually die of poison. The ironic thing is, this leaf was valued at five US dollars today, and it was too expensive for them to afford. And this was the only reason that the fear didn't consume all the happiness in their life. Gandhi goes on in his autobiography, and he talks about how contemplating suicide um, is much harder than, shoot. Contemplating suicide is much harder than carrying out with suicide. And I just want everyone to remember that you can never underestimate what someone is going through. And if you're ever in a situation that you need to reach out and get help, make sure you do it, even if you feel like you're not. So I wanted to tie this into my own life. I wanted to tell you how this changed my personal life. On two separate occasions, the ringing of a cell phone consumed my life with fear. It was the death of two people very close to me. One was my best friend, Sam, and the other was my grandmother. Sam died of a freak ski accident at the age of 17. My grandmother died of pancreatic cancer at the age of 82. Both of their deaths hurt me in ways I couldn't even imagine. I would wonder, why them? Why not more time? And all I wanted was one more conversation with them. And I'm not going to lie, getting over their deaths took a lot of crying, a lot of struggle, a lot of wondering. But how I move on and how I live with their memories is all the happy times. And I wish today I could share with you all the Christmases and birthdays that I shared with them but I don't have enough time for that. But I think it's important. Remember their times. Remember how they changed my life and how I'm going to move forward. I want to leave you with a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. If I had no sense of humor, I would have committed suicide long ago. He realized this relationship between fear and happiness. You need to realize your own relationship with fear and happiness. Put your right foot forward. Live your life to the fullest and try to experience the best that humanity has to offer. Thank you.